You know, we were just talking about how you can go to the most beautiful places in the world, right? But nothing compares to the presence of God with the body of Christ. I wouldn't trade it for the world. There's nothing that compares. So let's turn to the book of Jeremiah today. The title of the message that the Lord has put on my heart, and I thank God for confirming it this week, because I was like, Lord, I don't know if this is you. You know, I don't want to preach out of my own intellect or my own knowledge, but God is always faithful to come through, just like Sister Josie shared this morning. When we are empty, He fills us, right? The Lord is faithful. So Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. And the title of the message today is The Heart of the Father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your awesome presence. God, I thank you that you're faithful. You always come through, Lord God. You never fail. I ask that you would meet us today, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint this word to go into the depths of our being, the depths of our heart, soul, mind, God, and you would lift us up, O God, and cause us to behold you and see you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So today's message is the heart of the Father, and we're going to be reading in Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, I believe verses 1 to 18. So just as a context, in this chapter and section in the book of Jeremiah, it's uh, prophecies that focus on the hope and the future restoration of Israel. And so, you know, this message today really is about the heart of the father towards his children, because God is the God of hope and restoration. So the first part in the book of Jeremiah focuses Uh, largely centered on the warnings of God and judgment, and it was a call back uh, for the people to repentance. We see the prophet's message in the beginning part of this book has been to pluck up, um, the Lord says, to pluck up and to break down as God spoke to him in Jeremiah chapter 1. God was exposing in the context of this book the sin and idolatry of the people of Israel, and he was warning them of judgment to come and that they would be um, taken into Babylonian captivity. This part of the book in Jeremiah 31 that we're going to be reading today is about the glorious hope and restoration of Israel and the people of God, where the Lord said he would also build them and plant them. This message in Jeremiah 31 is a word of encouragement to the captives in Babylon that in God's timing, not our timing, but in God's timing, he would restore them and they would have joy as a people of God once again. It also ends with a revelation about the glorious new covenant that the Lord himself will and has accomplished through the cross. So in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 1, at the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Based on the context of the previous chapter in Jeremiah chapter 29 and 30, this is speaking prophetically of the latter days, of the last days. And it's speaking about a future restoration of all of Israel. God says, I will be the God of all the families of Israel. His desire is that all families and all people would be saved. At this point in time when Jeremiah was writing this, the ten northern tribes of Israel were defeated and they were taken into captivity by the Assyrian army as their judgment for their refusal to repent and turn back to God. Yet this is a future prophetic hope. God includes all of his people. Though he disciplined them and scattered them among the nations, he hasn't forgotten about them. He hasn't forgotten about his covenant promises. And in the latter days, he promised that he would bring them back. He will not only gather them back in their own land, which he accomplished in 1948, but they will one day know them as the Lord God, their Messiah. And God says in this verse one, and they shall be my people. This speaks and points to a covenant relationship, a people who not only hear of God, who know of God in their minds or do religious works, but are people who truly come to know him personally and intimately as their God. They shall be my people. They that know their God would be strong and do great exploits. 
Here you see in verse 1 God's desire for us to know Him personally. And the name for God here in verse 1 is Jehovah, meaning the existing one. Also, Yahweh, or I am. This is the proper name for the one true God. And what's different with this name, Jehovah, apart from the other names of God like El Shaddai, right? Is that this means Jehovah is the God of grace, dwelling with his people, guiding them, and manifesting his grace, revealing himself to them as the covenant-keeping God. And in verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. In the New Living Translation, it says this, This is what the Lord says. Those who survive the coming destruction will find blessings even in the barren land. For I will give rest to the people of Israel. The King James Version says, Thus saith the Lord, the people who were left behind, the people who were left of the sword, found grace in the wilderness when I went to cause him to rest. So who were these people? The people of God. In its context, it's referring to the Israelites, the Jewish people. And true rest, according to Hebrews, we know is found in relationship with Jesus Christ. We talked about rest in our worship this morning. I thank God for the worship team for ushering us in to the presence of the almighty God. Like, just just think about that. We're ushered into the presence of the almighty God where we can taste and see and know that he is good, that he's alive and that he's near us, right? And we find rest in his presence, rest from the battles, Physically, mentally, emotionally, peace that surpasses all understanding. And God desires that we would daily come into the rest, true rest that's available in Jesus Christ. It says they found grace in the wilderness. That in wilderness places that we walk through, this earth, this this world is a wilderness place for believers. We are pilgrims passing through this wilderness of sin, this wilderness of the world. But it says here, they found grace, that grace is available to us in this world, whatever wilderness or desert that people may be walking through, who are weary in their fight, who are weary in their battle, who are struggling personally, family-wise. It says they found grace, there's grace available. And this grace, it means favor. In the Hebrew, it means favor. They found favor favor in the wilderness. It means acceptance. It means kindness. And this wilderness also means desert, in the desert places. So this verse in verse 2 points to three things. First, Israel's wilderness wandering. And God's care over them by leading them through the cloud by day, right? And through the fire by night. It was pointing to a time of closeness between Yahweh and Israel. They survived the armies of Egypt and the enemies in the wilderness. They found and experienced the grace, presence, and mercy, and the supernatural provision of God in the wilderness. So the wilderness places isn't always a bad thing when God leads us, even through valleys of the shadow of death, when he leads us through desert places. It's not a bad thing because it's an opportunity to know and experience the power and the might and the presence of the almighty living God, personally in your life, right, and in your family's life. God told and reminded the children of Israel that in the wilderness, he bore them on eagle's wings and he carried them through to reveal himself to them in a personal way, to be their God, to manifest his presence and his grace to them. And he also gave them this promise. If you are willing, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the fruit of the land, the abundance of the land that he has for them. Today, to us, he's given us a new spirit, a new mind through Christ Jesus that we can partake of the riches of the fruit of the land. And now I'm not talking about just materially or physically in the world, but the fruit, the abundant fruit of the Holy Spirit that's available to us, 
right? Remember when the, um, the spies went in to spy out the land, it says they brought out fruit, giant grapes, right? They had to carry, two people had to carry the grapes and the fruit of the land because it was so heavy. It's a representation of the presence of God. It's a representation of what we can experience and the depths of God that we can experience even in the wilderness places. He says, if you are willing today, you can eat and partake in the table of God of the fruit of the land. This is more than just possessing material blessings. Although God takes care of our needs, right? But he has, there's a reward he has for faithful servants. He has a reward exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or think. Secondly, this verse also points to the latter days or the last days in the times it's called Jacob's trouble for the tribulation period where the Jewish people will go through um, intense or severe persecution. But in the end, the scripture says, there's a promise that the majority of those who survive will find true rest and grace in Jesus Christ. They will receive and acknowledge their Messiah in his second coming. But also, this is a picture of a believer who experiences the unmerited favor and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as I mentioned, in the wilderness of this world, in the wilderness of the world of Egypt that we are in. His grace, as I said, is available today for those who call upon him. It's by the grace of God you haven't and I haven't been destroyed in our sin, in our destruction, in our past. It's by his mercy he kept your life. My life, we're here today for a reason, for a purpose. While we were yet sinners, the scripture says, Christ died for us. Even in the miry clay, he lifts us out and calls us by name. Verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old. This is Jeremiah saying this, the prophet. The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. The Lord has appeared to me. This truth that Jeremiah is about to say, he's saying, this is not by my own revelation. What I'm about to tell you, it's not by my own knowledge, by my own um, intellect. God has appeared to me, the ancient of days, to give you this message, he's saying. It wasn't Jeremiah trying to encourage the people in his own strength. This is by divine appearance and divine revelation. The holy and the ancient of days is speaking here. And it starts off with saying, yes. God is already affirming his love and his word ahead of time. He says, yes, I have loved you. He's already affirming to them, yes, if you have any doubt in your mind, if you should have any doubt in your mind of the love of Christ and the love of God, I'm going to erase this doubt right now by telling you, yes, I have loved you. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Because I believe God knows how quick we are to doubt. I believe God knows how prone we are to unbelief in our human nature. To question his love when things outwardly don't go the way we expected. When we find ourselves in deep waters and wilderness places, it's easy in the human nature to doubt the love of God for us, the plan of God for our lives. And God is saying here, yes, To even erase those doubts, yes, the word is yes, the answer is yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This message was first spoken to Israel, but this love is God's love towards every believer. So you personalize this word today. Yes, 
Fill your name in that blank. If you have ever any doubt in your mind, God is already trying to, he's already erasing this doubt by saying, confirming, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, with my loving kindness right now, in the places that you have been and walked through, I am using it to draw you unto myself. I'm drawing you unto myself. You're here today because I am drawing you not to a person, right? Not to a church or a ministry, but he's drawing you unto himself into his presence. The word loving kindness, he says, with loving kindness, it means has said. It's the faithfulness or unfailing care of God. With the faithfulness, with my faithfulness or unfailing care, I have drawn you and I am drawing you. Through circumstances we may face or may not understand, he is drawing us to himself with his loving kindness. Sometimes people may go through periods of loneliness where even those around you cannot fill or fill that void in your heart, cannot meet your innermost needs. Your spouse cannot do it. But it's in this season where the Lord is drawing you to himself. There was a season, especially when I was in Bible school, I had no one or nothing, but it was a special time because the Lord shut me in. He shut me in with himself. It's like I couldn't turn to anyone or anything, but I just could just turn to God. And it's in those places, right, where you receive the grace of God, where you draw near to him in these places, your roots will grow deep and you will see him in ways that you've never known before. And he promises to his people in verse 4, again I will build you. And you shall be rebuilt. O virgin of Israel, you shall be again be adorned with tambourines, and you shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall plant vines in the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. This is a promise of God of rebuilding what has been torn down or destroyed. What seems to be hopeless, what seems to be impossible. Remember when Babylon took over Jerusalem, they destroyed and annihilated the city. The temple was destroyed. It was reduced to rubble. The people were hopeless, right? Because the temple to them was a symbol of the presence and the favor of God. So everything that they knew of God externally was destroyed, right? And they had a hopelessness and they were sent into captivity. But God is speaking to them even in captivity that God is the God. He's able to restore what the canker worm has eaten. He can rebuild what's been torn down in our lives, in our family's life, in our children's life. God, this is his specialty. He specializes in this. God is telling his people, I'm going to rebuild and restore what the enemy has taken, what the enemy has destroyed, what the canker worm has eaten. He's doing something better. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the first. And in the last days, he will pour out his spirit abundantly. So this is not only a promise for the people of Israel, but God's covenant people who now, you know, majority or collectively have rejected the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. Yet the Lord still promises to restore them and fulfill the covenant promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He can do this to an entire people that's scattered all over the world. How much, your, how much more your life? How much more your life? He can do this to an entire people, millions of people that were scattered through ages throughout the world to bring them back into their own land for them to know and receive and live in the covenant promises of God again one day. How much more in your life? This is a promise of what we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. A promise of rejoicing. And a promise, a promise in him, there's deliverance. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise and let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. You know, the role of the watchman in the ancient times was to warn of judgment, to warn of the, unco- the enemy coming, right? The enemy ahead to sound an alarm of invaders, to sound an alarm of destruction, to be, to be that voice of um, warning of God's judgment. But here, in this time, God is saying, the watchmen now, they're going to have a different alarm. 
they're going to have a different voice. Right? They're going to say, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's a call for the watchmen right, to come and gather people to the house of God. And God is raising up watchmen to call people back into the house of God. Arise. Arise, the watchmen are saying. The Lord says, arise. They will say, arise and let us go up to Zion. Right? Swing wide ye heavenly, heavenly gates and let the king of glory come in. The gates are open. The presence, the doors are open. The doors of the ark are open right now for people to find refuge and safety and deliverance in him. And so the sound of the watchmen now, this is the promise of God. They're going to say, arise, let us go up to Zion. Zion means the presence of God. Let us arise and let us go up to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout. There's going to be a shout of gladness and deliverance and shout among the chief of the nations, proclaim and praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnants of Israel. There's going to be God is birthing in his people, in his church, a cry for um, unity, a cry for God that with one voice and one heart, they would cry, Lord, save us. Lord, come, come, Lord Jesus. Just like in Revelation, come, Lord Jesus. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Behold, this talks about the gathering of God first, like I said, prophetically, of the Jewish people back to their own land. But it's also prophetically about the gathering of the church. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them, the blind, God calls the blind and the lame and the weak, right? The woman with child, the one who labors with child. A great throng shall return there. Again, this was God's promise to bring people back into their own land. And as I mentioned, he did this in 1948. He will gather them into their own land because he will, he doesn't forget the covenant promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But again, we also have a promise in Christ that he will gather the saints, he says in the New Testament, in the last days. It says, at the sound of a trumpet, at the sound of a trumpet, at the shout of the archangel, it says, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who remain will be caught up to meet him. All of those who remain from the four corners of the earth will be caught up to meet him in the air, and there, thus they shall ever be with the Lord. There is a gathering coming, right? Just like in the parable of the ten virgins, there's the shout of the bridegroom is coming, and everyone is invited into the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's the shout that's coming, the voice of God. The sound of the trumpet, there is a gathering for those in Christ. Our bridegroom is coming for, to gather his bride. And they shall come with weeping, it says in verse 9. With supplications, I will lead them. God promises for his people, I will cause them. This is a promise of God's future restoration and hope. But this is also a promise to believers of what we have in Jesus, right? Right? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water. You can walk by the rivers of living water. In Psalm 23, it says, He leads me to green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, right? If you're thirsty and you're weary and you're dry, come to the fountain of life to drink. Rivers of living water, He can refresh your soul and your mind and your body. No joke this week, I was just like, Lord, you know, I'm seeking God. God is speaking to me personally, but I was just like, Lord, I I feel like I have nothing to give. I have, I'm empty, God. But Jesus was like, this is a good place because when you're emptied of yourself, then I can fill you. It's not your mind. It's not your knowledge. It's not anything of yourself that you're going to get the glory from. But when you're emptied of yourself, he fills us, right? He causes our cup to overflow. He satisfies us with manna every single day and little do you know when you seek him every day and he gives you fresh manna that manna is enough to sustain you it will be enough to sustain you in the hard times to come it will be enough to sustain you even when your flesh is weary and you feel empty the word of God comes through he always comes through it says they will walk in a straight way 
He will give us the grace to walk in a straight way, in the straight and narrow path. They shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel. He is a father to the fatherless. And Ephraim is my firstborn. You're going to be like a firstborn. You know, in the, in the biblical times, the firstborn had a special blessing. The oldest child had a special blessing, right, from the father. Zechariah 12.10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. We are now in the age of grace, but not grace as a license to sin, right? But grace to walk in the narrow way, grace to seek him, grace to live a holy life, an obedient life, grace to be all that God is calling us to be. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as the one mourns. This is talking about Israel in the last days. For his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for his firstborn. Many sitting today in churches, not all, but are under this weight of an orphan spirit. And what do I mean by that? Someone who truly believes in Jesus, but living under the weight of condemnation, oppression, lies of the enemy, which hinder their spiritual growth and fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. It's an orphan spirit. Living as an orphan. When you are in Christ, the son and daughter of the Most High God. I was sharing with someone recently. And I was like, you know, don't settle for crumbs when God is giving you a seat at the table. Because this person was like, you know what, I'm I'm just praying God just don't let go of me. I'm just content just to be outside the door. You know, or at at the entrance of the door. But I was like, don't settle for crumbs. You're settling for crumbs when God is giving you a seat at the table to feast with him. Don't live as an orphan when you are a son and daughter of God, like you have no heavenly father. Because Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. You can receive the same measure the same presence, the same revelation as many great men and women of God. For those who seek me will find me if they search for me with all of their heart. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare this in the isles afar off and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. This is a command and declaration to hear the word of God. Jeremiah is saying in verse 10, hear the word of the Lord. This is not, notice here, this is not just for Israel. He says, oh nations, even the islands who are far away. Yes, Philippine islands, you know, even the islands who are far off. Hear the word of the Lord. He who scatters will also gather. He can gather, he will gather his people and he will shepherd. He wants to shepherd us, be the shepherd of our souls, right? And lead us and cause us to taste and see that he is good. To be restored, to be strengthened. Hear what the Spirit is speaking. It's by the word of God the heavens and earth was formed. It's, by the, it's the word of God. It says, hear the word of the Lord. It's the word of God that brings life, that brings peace. It's a command for nations. And islands to hear his word of God's redeeming and faithful love to gather and keep his people, to shepherd them. God is not finished with Israel. And God is not finished with you and me. The Bible says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God is going to gather his people, physical people, the Jewish people in the last days, and Christ will gather his bride, the church. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. 
God has redeemed and rescues us. Who has this testimony? Who can testify of that today? God has redeemed me. God has rescued me from the hand of one stronger than me. Right? Did you deliver yourself? Did you break yourself out of that bondage? Did you break those chains, the chains in your life? No. Did you renew your own mind? No. He ransomed him. He rescued us. He rescues us. In ourselves, we're powerless to defeat sin. In our human nature, to defeat the enemy, to tear down strongholds, to overcome the flesh. But through Christ, we can do valiantly. Through Christ, we can do all things through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who pulled us out of the miry clay. He has redeemed Jacob. He's redeemed his people by his blood. He did the work. It's the finished work of Christ. As a result of this knowledge, as a result of this, the people of God, it says in verse 12, they will come and sing in the height of Zion. When you have this revelation, when you have this experience, when you come into the knowledge more and more, deeper and deeper, you're going to have more joy. The more you behold him, the more you really see him and experience his presence, joy will naturally overflow. Rejoicing will overflow no matter what you're going through. No matter what's taking place around you. You're going to be able to sing songs. How are you able to worship when you're going through a storm of your life? You know, how are you able to testify? How are you able to do that? It's the power of God. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because you see, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. And you can experience Jesus in the wilderness places. You know, recently I, I took the kids out to the desert. And um, I was making my morning coffee because I wanted to spend time with the Lord before they woke up. I look out the window, I see this beautiful sunrise. And I'm sharing this. It's a picture of God's grace, the heart of the Father. And it's also a picture of the Christian walk that the Lord gave me, like, in a literal sense. So I go outside to see the sunrise. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I want to. I felt compelled to go spend that time with the Lord. And so I'm walking, and I'm walking down this road. I don't know where I'm going. We're in the middle of a literal desert, right? In the middle of the wilderness, really. And then the road I'm on is called Sunrise Road. And I don't know where I'm going. I'm just following the sun, right? I don't know. We don't know the way that they take. The children of Israel, when they were going through the wilderness, they didn't know the way that they should go, but they're following the cloud. They're following the presence of God. And they trusted that. And we can trust that you're just following. You have your eyes on Jesus. He's going to lead you to a straight path. So I was walking down a sunrise road and I didn't even know where I'm going, but that, that street led me to the entrance of the desert of the wilderness. And And then as I'm just following the sun, I see before me is a path that God literally makes a way. You know, when you hear that song, he's a way maker, right? Promise keeper. He makes streams in the desert and he makes way in the wilderness. He literally made a way for me in the wilderness, right? And as I'm fixing my eyes on the sun and just worshiping the Lord and crying out to Jesus, that path is straight. Right? It's keeping me. And all around me, there's stones and there's rocks. But guess what happened? When I got distracted with my phone, taking too many pictures. When I got distracted and I wasn't looking up at the sun, I ran into a cactus. It's a good thing I had a blanket because I got thorn. The cactus got all over. Right? And then I had to pluck out the cactus thorns one by one and it was all over the blanket. But I was still protected. Right? There was still a protection, even when I was looking away, even when I got distracted, even when I got off the path, when I got my eyes off the sun, the son of God. I ran into a cactus, but it didn't destroy me. It didn't overcome me. There was still a protection and a grace there. And so I go back on the path and I'm just worshiping God and enjoying the beauty of the Lord on the straight path. And and I heard coyotes. But I'm like, Lord, I'm here with you. You're going to protect me. And then when I got distracted again, taking too many pictures, I tripped and stumbled over a rock and almost fell. And you see what happens. And that's like the Christian walk. You don't, we don't know. God has called you and God has called me. And in this calling of God, we don't know exactly the path that he has for us. We don't know the future. We all, all we know is God, you're leading me. 
I've surrendered my life to you. I've given you everything. My life is at the altar. I don't know the path that you're leading me, but I know the heart of the Father. I know your heart and that you're good and that you love me. And I don't know the path ahead. And I've been led into a literal desert place where there's cactus and coyotes around. But if I'm walking on the path that it was a narrow path, literally in this desert, it was a narrow path. But if I stay along this path, I'll be safe. If I keep my eyes fixed on the sun, I'll be okay. And it's a picture of the Christian walk. God leads us, but it's in the wilderness I found grace. The grace of God, the presence of God, the mercy of God. And you know what? I was trying to recreate this moment with the Lord the next day, and I feel like it was out of my own flesh. I'm like, God, I'm going to wake up extra early. I'm going to do this. And then as I go back on that same road and that same path 50 feet ahead, is like a coyote. So I ran for my life. I literally just ran for my life. But it's a good thing I was watching right? I was watching. I was watchful. I was aware. I was discerning, right? And I was just like, and I started laughing with the Lord because I was like, I get it, God, you know? When we try to go things at our own strength, right? You'll run into coyotes. You'll run into all these things. I don't think, you know, because I was just like, I wanted to recreate that moment with the Lord, right? But you can't recreate what God does. Only God can make those special moments. Only God can do that. Right? But I was watchful, and it's a good thing I ran away. It's the same thing with the Christian walk in our life when we're walking through this wilderness. Right? God gives us eyes to see when you're looking up ahead and your eyes are fixed on Jesus. When you see danger coming, when you see temptation coming, run away. Run for your life like Joseph. Right? In in Potiphar's house, when the temptation came, what did he do? He like ran for his life. And I ran for my life when I saw that coyote. I was out of breath in the house. But I thank God for his grace. It's his mercy. It's his protection. And I was like, God, you're so amazing to do this. You know, you give us glimpses. You see the reality. The word of God comes alive. This is the beauty of walking with God. He makes his word and his presence a reality wherever we go. I could be in New York. I could be in another state. But I'm praying, Lord, manifest your presence wherever I go. Open a door. God, give me divine appointments. Lord, use me, God, wherever I am. And praise God he did that. And the Lord is just like, I'm not just sending you to places for your own enjoyment, but this is for the glory of God and for the souls of men. Even if it's one soul, the Lord will send you. The Lord sent me all the way across the country for one soul. That's the heart of the Father. All the way. You know when the Bible says, go the extra mile? (laughs) He literally, we went extra miles. And I was telling the girls, you know what girls? This is ministry. It's not only when I'm standing on a pulpit. It's not only when I'm in front of people, right? But it's reaching, going across the country to encourage someone. That the, you would carry the presence of God and you would meet people in their brokenness, in their desperation, in their loneliness. He left the 99, this is the heart of the Father. He left the 99 to go for that one sheep and he says he did not stop until he found that lost sheep. This is the heart of the father. I was like, girls, I want you to take note of this moment because you see mommy and daddy, you know, daddy's leading worship in here, but ministry is not only, right? It's not limited, right? Today, and especially in today's generation, it's, it's been limited to that. If I have a large following, if I have a large church, if I have thousands of followers, if we have a big building, No, but it's going just to one. And the Bible says God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, right? To reconcile others to the Father. But in order for that to happen, be reconciled first. Reconciled first to God. Verse 14 says, I will satiate the souls. Am I saying that right? Satiate? Satiate? (laughs) The soul of the priest. The priests, those who serve in the temple of God, he says, their soul with abundance and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Many priests and pastors are weary today. They want to give up. They want to give up ministry. Fathers, mothers. But he says, he will satisfy your soul with abundance in his presence, with his goodness. So this, this is a picture right here of a people restored. 
their souls will be like a well-watered garden. Their mourning will be turned to joy. It's a picture also of revival, of the dry bones coming alive and living. Israel was mourning under the captivity and exile in Babylon. But even in the midst of their captivity, God was giving them hope that their sorrow would be turned to joy and that the plan and the purposes of God will prevail. Verse 15, thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord to his people, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in verse 17. There is hope for your future, says the Lord, and that your children shall come back to their own border. Praying parents, take that promise. Take it, grab hold of it, stand on it, because I'm living proof of this promise. Your children will come back to where they need to be. They will come back into the border of the house of the Lord. They will come back into the border, the border that God established for them. There is hope. There's a prophetic picture. Rachel, who is the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, they were prominent tribes, right? And they were weeping in despair of what was to take place, of what was taking place. It also was a prophetic picture of, you know, what happened in Bethlehem during the time in the birth of Jesus when Herod Um, slaughtered all the babies. Yet the Lord is saying to his people, those in captivity, those today feeling discouraged and hopeless in sorrow and grief, refrain from weeping. Sorrow and grief. And you know, the Lord has been making this so real to me. Sorrow and grief doesn't have the final word. It doesn't have the final say. Because Jesus rose from the grave. He has the final word. One writer puts it as this. He commanded comfort to the one who refused to be comforted. And in verse 17, we see a promise of hope for the Lord, of the children of Israel returning. And God says to his people, your work shall be rewarded. The labor of love, your prayers, it's not in vain. Whatever God has called and asked you to do and you have obeyed his will, He said, your work shall be rewarded. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love of which you have shown towards his name. You do it for the glory of God in your heart. You do it for the glory of God, for his name alone and not your name. And that you have ministered to the saints and you still do minister. He's not unjust to forget that. And the Lord doesn't stop here with all of these promises of redemption and restoration. In the end of this chapter, we see the picture and the glimpse of the new covenant. It wasn't fulfilled in Jeremiah's day, but it was a promise. And they looked and held on to it by faith. Behold, the days are coming, and we know this is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. A new covenant with the house of Israel. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This new covenant begins with an inward change. And an inward transformation by the Holy Spirit. You must be born again. It's not an external knowledge. But God would change their hearts and minds of those who receive this new covenant in Christ. Right? It's no longer external based like the law back then. But it's the reality of Christ in me. The hope of glory. It's an intimate and personal knowledge for themselves. This new covenant brings us into a new relationship with God. I pray, you know, on Tuesdays, Pastor Alex has been sharing the word on the new covenant. And I pray that we would continue to understand the truth and the knowledge, 
right? Not that we're, we have arrived into perfection, but to go deeper and deeper, step by step, line by line, precept upon precept. Because the more we understand his truth, the more we have revelation of the knowledge of who he is, the more we're going to walk in freedom and power and anointing, not for ourselves, but like I said, it's for the glory of God to be a vessel of reconciliation, right? To be that bridge, to bring people to God, to restore what the canker worm has eaten. An example, and you are familiar with this, is the lost sheep of the heart of the Father. Luke chapter 15. I know we're familiar with this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine and go after the one until he finds it? He says, "Go." he goes after which is lost until he finds it. So notice that. He goes after, he's not going to stop. He pursues. He doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. We grow weary. When people reject us, when people say things about us, when people don't accept us, we want to give up. We're like, oh, forget about it, you know? But Jesus is not like that. He says, until he finds it. And notice it says, if he has a hundred sheep, if, if one of the sheep, not a goat, it's not a goat, but it's a sheep. A sheep that was once part of the fold. To the Lord, one soul is valuable. All of heaven rejoices over one soul that comes to repentance. As a godly father or mother doesn't stop praying, they don't give up for their children. I thank God for parents that didn't give up praying for me. (laughs) You know, because, man, if you knew me back then, right? If you knew, if you only knew. Like a godly father and mother, they don't stop. They don't stop no matter how bad it seems. Because I was really far off. I'm telling you, like 10 times worse. They didn't stop giving up praying for their children. So how much more the shepherd of our souls? How much more our heavenly father? Right? No matter what they've done. So the shepherd of our souls goes after the sheep and pursues us. And when he has found it, He lays it on his shoulders. He carries them. Knowing that they're probably too weak from all of that wandering to walk themselves. So he carries them. He bears them. He's gentle. He's easy to entreat. He's merciful and he's kind. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. And in the same chapter, and we have another um, parable, which we're familiar with, is the prodigal son. We know this, right? The son went away. He spent his inheritance outside of the father's house. And he got himself into the pit with the swine. But in verse 17, it says he came to himself. He came to his senses. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and I perish with hunger? In verse 18, this is the grace of God. I will arise. This revelation came to him. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And many people are stuck in this place. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Right? This is the weight of condemnation. I'm no longer worthy to be called your daughter. But what did the father do? It doesn't end here. The parable doesn't end here. He says, and it says, and he arose and came to his father. And when he was a great way off, this is the heart of the father. The father saw him afar off and had compassion. We need to come into the knowledge of this, I pray. You know, because this will bring freedom. You know, this is a prayer for myself, a freedom in our walk. You know, a heart for others so that we wouldn't be like the older brother. Because that's a religious spirit. And that religious spirit hinders the work of God. And hinders the sheep from coming back to the Lord. So we need to know the heart of the Father. And some people stop right there. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. But look up. Because you see the Father is afar off with compassion running. And it says the Father and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the father, what did he do? He restored him. He gave him authority. He put a robe of righteousness on him. Sandals on his feet. 
He killed a fatted calf. There was a celebration. This is the heart of the Father to restore what was lost. And this is a picture of the restoration and the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. Not in ourselves, but this is by the grace and mercy of God. This is the heart of the Father. Don't stay stuck in the thought and in the mindset, I'm not worthy and under this weight of an orphan spirit of condemnation. Right? Settling outside the door. Settling. Come into the house. Don't stay outside. You know when people come into your house, especially Filipinos, you're like, come in, sit down, let me feed you. Uh, oh, take, you know, they set out a whole spread. That's the way the Father is. Come into the house. You know? Filipinos, God made our culture as a picture of God's table. Come in. You know, Filipinos are known as the most hospitable people, right? When foreigners travel to the Philippines. But that's the same way with the, with the lost son or the lost daughter. And some are like, oh, I'm just going to stay outside. No, I'm okay. I'll stay outside here. They're like, no, there's a feast prepared before you. Come inside. Sit down. You belong here. You belong here. May this be a year that prodigals return home. May we be vessels of the heart of the father. But there's a hindrance is the older brother and it's that religious spirit that would hinder that because he didn't know the heart of the father. In verse 25, when all this was happening, the older brother wasn't even in the house. He was out in the field. And it says he came and drew near And he heard music and dancing. He wasn't even aware of what was going on. He wasn't aware that God rejoices over one sinner that comes to repentance. He wasn't aware. He was outside in the field, off probably doing his own labors or whatever. And he didn't even ask the father what was happening. It says he called one of the servants. He could have asked his father. He could have asked his father. He lives in that house too. But he didn't. He called one of the servants and asked them what these, what's happening? What are these, what do these things mean? And you know this in verse 27. Your brother has come and, and because he has, re- he has been, re- we received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. That's what the servant is saying. And the son became angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father even came out and pleaded with this, with the son. He's pleading with his people. But this is a hindrance. In the work of God. It's this religious spirit. And the father said many years. And he said to the father. Many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment. I did everything. I followed you know. To the best of my ability. I did all of these things. But you never did this for me. But as soon as the son of yours came. He devoured. Look at all that he did. You killed the fatted calf. And the father said, you are, you, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. The, that, that prodigal son, the older brother, didn't know the heart of the father. But he could have. But he was outside in the field. He didn't even ask the father what was happening. He asked the servant. But the father's like, all that I have is yours. You're here. You could have came in. Right? And, and it's this spirit that would resist the work of God, especially in the last days. Especially to those who genuinely um, have a desire to come back to the Lord. And I'm going to close with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Know all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And it says he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And, and, you know, when it says this in verse 18, this is not just for some. He hasn't given some the ministry of reconciliation. He hasn't just given the worship leader the ministry of reconciliation or just the pastor the re- ministry. It says he has given us, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation. First is the first step is be reconciled to God first. Be reconciled. And that's between you and the Lord, right? I don't know where you're at. I know where I'm at. I know when I need to be reconciled. I know when I need to go back to my first love. I know when I'm dry. I know when I got distracted. But that's between you and the Lord. But the first step, be reconciled to God himself. And know the heart of the Father through Jesus Christ. 
And then we are to be co-laborers with Christ, to be called to be ministers of reconciliation through the spirit which dwells inside of us. That you and I would be vessels in these last days, fit for the master's use, to reconcile young and old, men and women, to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a ministry just for some, but it's a ministry for all. The ministry of reconciliation is the restoration of the favor of God to sinners that repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ. It's a restoration to favor. And Paul says this in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was was pleading through us. We implore you. This is the words of the apostle Paul, but this is the heart of God. We implore you. We implore you. This means to invoke, to invite, coupled with prayer. It means to call near. We implore you, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the Lord made this truth such a reality to me and confirmed it to me. He had me going across the country for one soul. For one soul. Right? And as I was sharing just the word of God with someone, they were like, they felt the presence of God there. They felt the presence of God there. And you know what? At the end of the day, and you know, we went to the desert. We went to the most beautiful places. You know, I took the kids out. But let me tell you something. That moment when the presence of God came and that person experienced the rest- restoration and the love and the grace and the mercy of God in that place, that trumps any external thing. His presence is more beautiful. Just to be able to witness that. You know, wherever we go, that's our prayer. Wherever we go, you're working. Lord, that's my prayer. God, give me a divine appointments when I'm here, Lord. Open doors, oh God. Let me speak to someone. And you know, it's funny because it's not even the... Um, what I had planned. I thought it was going to be to someone else or through another way. But God always surprises us. When you are willing, when you're willing wherever. And that's what at the end of the day, it's about God. It's about the glory of God and showing the heart of the Father. And I pray that we would come more into the knowledge of this truth, that those who are outside of the house, that those who are too afraid to come in, that those who are broken and who are weary, and many are broken and weary, many are living as orphans in the house of God, that we would first know the heart of the Father, be reconciled of God, and we would be ministers of reconciliation. We're all called, especially in these days. The doors of the ark are closing soon. Church, the doors of the ark are going to close soon. I don't know what's ahead, but God knows, and I know what His Word says. And God is calling by His people, come aboard. And we are His vessels. It starts one by one. And that's our prayer. God, first let us know the heart of the Father. Right? It starts off in that place of knowing this truth. With loving kindness, you have drawn me. And in my emptiness, in my weakness, I'm like, Lord, I have nothing. He's amazing. He fills you. He pours out his spirit. He opens doors no man can shut. So truly, all of the glory goes to God and not of yourself. You have nothing to boast. I have nothing to boast. But if I boast in anything, I boast in Jesus. I boast in my Jesus. I boast in his strength. I boast in his power. I boast in his healing. I boast in his restoration. I boast that all of the strength and the power goes to him and him alone. That wherever I go, he goes before me. That we are vessels fit for the master's use to restore people to the heart of the father. And it's not just for some. It's not just for me. It's for all of us in these last days. This is the army of God. This is the army of God. This is the people of God. This is the bride of Christ. And he's saying, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. With loving kindness, I have drawn you. So I was going into the desert. He drew me into a literal desert. But in that desert, I beheld him. And I experienced him. And I saw his beauty. And in that place, he filled me when I was empty. And then after the desert, he sent me out. And that's what the Lord does with us, right? Right? So in desert places, in the wilderness of this world in Egypt, draw near unto him and he will draw near into you. And I pray that we would know 
continually and experience the heart of the Father so we can be ministers of reconciliation today, even if it's just for one. You know, some people may boast of large numbers and thousands of people, right, and stadiums, but what heaven rejoices over one, one son or one daughter, one brother or one sister. You know, may we know the heart of the Father in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word. And I know, God, that this is your heart and this is your mercy and your love towards your people. I pray, Father God, that you would lift your people up. You would lift us up, Lord God. And you say in your word, as we behold you, we are changed from image to image and from glory to glory. God, may we see your face. Lord, may we behold your beauty, Lord God, in the wilderness place that you would come and reveal yourself, Lord God. You say, with loving kindness, I have drawn you, Lord God. You draw us unto yourself, Lord. And I thank you. It's not only for us, but it's to send us out so we can draw others unto you, Lord God, especially in this generation, especially in these times which we are living in, Father. And I thank you, God, that it's your grace and your mercy and your strength alone, Father. All the praise goes to you. In your mighty name, amen.